everybody, it's Dr. Linda along with Dr. Stuart Nelson of the Beckman Laser Institute. Today is our Facebook Live session brought to you by the Vascular Birthmarks Foundation concerning the use of the pulse dye laser for treating vascular birthmarks. Start sending your questions in as soon as possible. And welcome to our, our Facebook Live session. I'm not seeing it. It says it's live. It says live. If, some, if anybody sees us, oh, here we go. We've got somebody who already joined. Hi, Gabriella. Hi, Gabby. Send your question so we can see it. She's probably typing away. That's the family from Mexico that we were just talking about. Okay, I'm not seeing it on the VBF page, so it should be live. Oh, here it is. There we are. So I'll start seeing the question. All right, everybody, let's start seeing those questions. Just while we're waiting, remember, there's still time to register for our conference, which is Saturday, October 7th. Go to birthmark.org to register. Dr. Nelson will be there, and we are going to be offering free laser treatments, but we'll be limited by when you sign up, so make sure you sign up. We're seeing people joining the group. We haven't seen any questions come through yet, so make sure you're sending your, submitting your questions as soon as you log in. Okay, we have a lot of people joining. Let's see some questions. We'll be talking today about the use of the pulse dye laser for treating vascular birthmarks. Dr. Nelson, who's with me right here on my right, who is at the, uh, the director of the Beckman Laser Institute and is our lit, one of our leading laser experts in the world, will be answering your questions on the use of the laser to treat vascular birthmarks. Uh, I've seen we have many people who've joined. We just need to see some of your questions appear. I see six comments. Okay, so so I'm I'm seeing people saying they're coming. Um, Alonso has a slight infection and has a scar. Can it be treated with laser? I don't know why we're not seeing these questions on here. Uh, we see who the viewers are, but we're not seeing the questions. But um, so that I'll, I'll let you know that Gabriella Castellanos wants says uh, uh, Alonso has a, stri a slight scar. Can he be treated? Absolutely, using the fractional laser in combination with the pulse dye laser, it shouldn't be a problem to remove any skin textural change uh, after perhaps maybe one to three treatments with the fractional laser. Yeah, I don't know why we're not seeing the questions on here. What is the recovery process after the laser treatment and how often is it recommended to have a treatment? My two-week-old was born with port wine. If it's a two-week-old, at our institution we're treating those children aggressively every two to four weeks. And typically those children will be a bruise for about five to seven days after each laser treatment. Jody Lee says, what is the recommended number of treatments before maintenance phase for a V3 port wine stain? Well, V3 port wine stains can be very, very difficult, particularly the areas that are on the lateral side of the, the head and neck, but I would probably go for at least probably five to ten treatments at least at the minimum uh, before uh, going to a maintenance type of program. So once again, um, I don't know why we're not seeing the questions on our larger screen, but I am getting them on my phone. Uh, Gabrielle wants to know, what is a V3 port wine stain? Your head and neck is divided. The Your forehead is the first branch of the fifth cranial nerve. We call that V1. This your is cheek V1. Is, v, V2. is V2. And the mandible uh, upper neck part is V3. So when we're talking about the V3 distribution of a port wine stain, we're talking about the skin surface area that corresponds to the third branch of the fifth cranial nerve. All right, so Chell wants to know, can you treat gums, and how do you treat the gum area? You can treat the gums as long as you're not in the area immediately adjacent to the nerve root of the tooth, because that also contains the blood supply, and if you use the pulse dye laser over the nerve root, you can actually destroy the blood supply to the tooth. So you have to stay away from the immediate uh, nerve root area of the Jesse tooth. wants to know how you protect the eye area when you're treating it. Uh, we put a metallic contact lens into the patient's orbit uh, so that the orbit is completely covered. 
Um, Megan says her daughter has hemihypertrophy, which causes her right leg to be much larger. Um, it's her port wine stain from hip to the toe. Will this cause laser treatment to be less successful? Well, before contemplating any type of laser treatment, your daughter needs to be worked up for Klippeltranane syndrome to make sure that she doesn't have an underlying problem uh, that not only is the port wine stain, but also includes a congenital absence of the lymphatic as well as the deep venous system. So before laser treatment, I would recommend that your child have a magnetic resonance angiogram of her entire evolved extremity to rule out underlying Klippeltranane syndrome. Mel wants to know how hard is the cheek to treat? My seven-month-old has a port wine covering a lot of her left treat. The cheek responds, but the most difficult area will be the, those sites closer to the midline. Uh, the lateral cheek responds the best. Uh, the medial cheek will respond to laser treatment, uh, but it tends to require more treatments as compared to the lateral side of the face. Um, Jackson, Sam says hi to Dr. Nelson. Hi, Julia and Levy. And um, Seattle is saying hello. Uh, Whitney wants to know, are you familiar with the Ellipse Selective Wave Band technology? I know it's an IPL. I saw good results online, but it seems like PDL is the way to go. We have an, uh, an IPL source here at Beckman, but I don't use it for the treatment of port wine stains. Uh, the laser is a much better choice because you're actually taking the yellow light, which is specifically what you need to target the hemoglobin. Uh, when you're using an IPL, you're wasting a lot of the, the light that's coming out of the laser. Uh, the light that's coming out of the device. An IPL is not actually a, a laser, but I'm not going to go into the differences between an IPL and a laser, but suffice it to say the laser is a much more efficient way of doing the treatment. Okay, Emily says her, Eileen says her 10-year-old daughter has bilateral V1, V3 <clears throat> and has had over 50 lasers. She has some lightning but has hypertrophy on her upper lip and some blebs. Will continued lasers help prevent further hypertrophy? The laser treatment will help prevent uh, the hypertrophy and it will also help and flatten and smoothen out those blebs. Uh, I'm not a, a dentist but I would recommend that they consult with Dr. David Darrow at the Medical College of Virginia who will actually be here at the conference in October uh, to get an opinion about how whether or not the treatment could be applied to the gums as well. Um, Jennifer Arnold says she's had many treatments as a child but insurance won't cover. Will my port wine continue to get worse, worried about hypertrophy? Jennifer, write to me too, Dr. Linda at birthmark.org, and we can help you with insurance, but I'll let Dr. Nelson answer the rest. Will it continue to get worse? She's it will worried. continue to get worse. It's slowly over time, the blood vessels do dilate. So, Jennifer, unfortunately, you're going to notice that slowly and insidiously, over time, your port wine stain is going to get darker, and the skin textural change will develop with probably the development of blebs or nodules. Uh, and other types of skin textural changes. So I would encourage you to seek the treatment as soon as possible uh, to prevent that sequelae from happening. Hi, hello from Australia. Um, Krasimir says he's treating his port wine stain on his forehead with a V-beam. It seems like it's fading, but it's turning brown. Can you suggest what laser I should use? Well, if you're down there or down under, you're probably getting a lot of Australian sunshine. And the reason your skin is looking brown is because of what we call post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which is a fancy medical word, which means that the yellow light is also absorbed by melanin in the upper layers of the skin. And so the melanocytes are actually being activated by the laser during the treatment. So the PIH, or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, will resolve on its own. Uh, you can treat it, treat it medically with hydroquinone, but at this point I would simply recommend to avoid all ultraviolet light exposure, wear a hat at all times as well as a sunscreen, and it should resolve spontaneously on its own. Uh, Mel says he's from New Zealand and he's told we don't treat until one year is old. I'm hoping for a high success rate despite this. Oh, I've been to New Zealand. I know there is some. There is a Dr. Paul Legrand. Uh, I believe he's in Auckland. Uh, uh, I've, I've communicated or se shared several patients with him. Uh, but we're trying to, through Linda and VBF, get the word out that the earlier you treat these infants and young children, the better the results you get with the laser treatment. Um, Tiff from Australia says she has a three-week-old with the stain. Can I ask what's the best age to start and the best treatment gap, I believe, she has a V2. Well, I think I answered that question early with the infants and young children now at our institution. Uh, we're treating every two to four weeks, 
in an outpatient setting, uh, with no anesthesia whatsoever. Uh, this can be done very safely. You can put a contact lens into the child's orbit easily, and it's a procedure that takes only two to three minutes done in an office-based type of situation. Whitney wants to know, do you re recommend photodynamic therapy in conjunction with PDL? If so, can you explain what photodynamic therapy is? Photodynamic therapy is when you place an artificial molecule into the system that specifically absorbs a certain color of light. Uh, classically, it's done with porphyrin derivatives, which absorb red light. Uh, we did a study here. I did one many, many years ago, and my colleague, Kristen Kelly, uh, did a study several years ago, which really didn't show that photodynamic therapy worked very well for port wine stains. So currently, we're not advocating the use of photodynamic therapy or PDT to treat port wine stains. Uh, thank you so much for the fundraiser, Biking for, for uh, Alonso, for sharing the video that we're doing right now live. So thank you very much, Gabriella. Um, we have more people joining, and we're doing a really good job of staying on top of the questions. So, um, Where are the questions? They're, they're, you've answered them all so far. But I don't see them. I know. They're not showing up on there. I'm getting them, and I don't know why. Um, Jody wants to know, if the port wine doesn't look like it's clearing or getting less red, are we still limiting mm -hmm. the potential for further complications? Yeah, because you're keeping the port wine stain from... from uh, developing the hypertrophy as well as also the development of vascular nodules. Uh, the other thing I would encourage you to do is with your physician review the pulse durations of the laser exposure that have been used. Uh, very often if uh, when somebody's doing multiple treatments they're using the same pulse duration of the laser and what happens is that you remove those blood vessels that are vulnerable to that certain pulse duration. So the patients who are treated at our institution almost on every treatment we try to vary the pulse duration of the laser exposure so that we can target blood vessels of different sizes in order to maximize the fading. Um, thank you for sharing Karina. Uh, Samantha Wisniewski wants to know um, she started treatments on her daughter at six, oh, I just lost it, at six months. She's had 11 with a lot of success. We get treatments in the fall and winter, about four a year. I'm not sure what the question is, but that's what she wanted to say, that she started them. Um, I guess she wants to know if that's a good plan. She started at six months and has had 11. Well, can, Samantha, would you be kind enough to please uh, let Linda know exactly how old your child is, and then I'll respond to that question. Uh, she gets four a year, and she started at six months, so she's a little over two. She's over two now? So, yeah. I mean, if, if she's not achieving significant fading, then that would be a realistic approach to have a treatment every three to four months a year. Crystal wants to know that someone mentioned a topical medis medicine to be used with laser. The name of the drug escapes me. Serolimus, that's the name. Well, it's either serolimus or rapamycin. Which is uh, the same. This is an approach that was actually developed in my lab. Uh, we came up with that concept in 2007 in collaboration with Dr. Mim at Harvard. Uh, we did find that this rapamycin, uh, it does, in a certain population of patients, help with the laser treatment, but the, the helpfulness or the improvement was very, very subtle. It was less than 5 to 10 percent, and most patients didn't actually appreciate uh, that whether or not the drug really helped. So at this but, particular point yeah. in time, we're not advocating the use of concurrent rapamycin. Uh, we are looking to start another trial, I hope very soon, with another anti-angiogenic agent. So hopefully in future Facebook uh, live sessions I'll be able to comment and on you, that. And you did say today you were, would reconsider the serolimus. Well, the problem with the rapamycin is it's very insoluble. So the companies have to use high concentrations of benzyl alcohol, which can make the rapamycin very irritating to the skin which was also a problem. So, you know, what, if some of those issues can be solved, then I think the idea of concurrent anti-angiogenic therapy should be revisited. Um, Whitney wants to know, if you don't get purpura during a treatment, is it still working? Well, the purpura has to do with the pulse duration of the laser exposure. If I want somebody to have purpura, I can simply use a short pulse duration of the laser. If I don't want somebody to get purpura, use longer pulse durations of the laser. So when I finish the laser treatment, I will come out and tell the family exactly what pulse duration I used and whether or not they can expect purpura. Because when you're treating with longer pulse durations, it, you're not going to get as much objective purpura immediately after the treatment's done. Um, Jennifer has one more. What about port wine that extends into the inner cheeks and throat? Well, if that's the case, then that child should be evaluated by an oral surgeon as well as an ENT specialist uh, to make sure that there's no compromise of the upper airway. 
Um, Jamie wants to know how often do you recommend treatments for an adult that is not seeing any lightening, like maintenance to prevent thickening? Well, for an adult, I probably would say maybe four to six months intervals, at least, you know, maybe twice a year. But again, I would encourage uh, you to review with your physician uh, the pulse durations of the laser that have been used and to see if there's some flexibility that might be offered in terms of using different pulse durations. Uh, Jacqueline Mazzani said to say hello. She's from St. Lucia and that Tori is doing great. No, go Ducks! <laughs> Um, Mariah says that her daughter has had three treatments, started at six, she's now 17 months. She's waiting for insurance approval. The doctor has used general anesthesia for three and says that the laser is painful. Is there any long-term complications from general anesthesia with all treatments? Well, the current evidence that we have at this particular point in time is no. The repeated uses of general anesthesia uh, do not cause a problem. Uh, most of the patients that we see at our institution, as well as Roy Geronimo sees in New York and those of us that are doing a lot of kids, these procedures are very short. We're talking about procedures that take less than five minutes. And in a young, healthy child, uh, that really shouldn't be a problem. Um, Whitney wants to know if there are any new lasers on the horizon. Well, Candela is going to be coming out next year with a new version of the V-beam. Uh, it, I can't remember exactly. Is it exact, the Prima? It's called the Prima. Thank you, Linda. Okay. We've actually already ordered one. Uh, the device will be more powerful. It will have a larger spot size. Uh, it also will have a, a faster repetition rate, which will allow us to do the treatments quicker. Uh, that's at least the only uh, new device that I'm aware of that's, on, that's not yet on the market. And Dr. Um, Geronimus, Dr. Nelson's colleague in the industry, is concluding his uh, study with that, and those results will be coming out soon. Um, uh, Justine wants to know, is it common for lightning to plateau after a few minutes and then continue? After a few minutes or after I mean, a, few a few treatments? treatments, few treatments. So it, it can. I mean, some port wine stains can be very resistant where you see very rapid improvement immediately. And then sometimes the differences after a few treatments become much more subtle. Oh, Tiff wants to know, is those under one years of age who don't go under treatment, who don't go under for treatment, should they use nothing, or can they use numbing cream, or does the numbing cream affect results? Well, the numbing cream, though, I'm always concerned about these numbing creams causing vasoconstriction, although some of my colleagues are not as concerned about that. But for most of the very young infants and children, it's pretty easy to do the treatment without any anesthetic whatsoever. Um, um, Beth wants to know, she hopes this is correct, um, we would like to hear about how if the use of numbing cream affects the effectiveness of laser, our son has had over 40 under GA without pain. I have heard adult patients still experience pain and discomfort during non-GA, and also numbing cream makes the laser less effective. We would like to know if that is true and how they prepare teenagers and adults for treatment with the PDL not under GA when it is a facial birthmark that surrounds the eye. So I guess that's a question on pain. And I just want to say, too, Dr. Geronimus treats about 100 patients a month without anesthesia, and they're from birth right up through 100 years of age. Yeah, but she's he talking about the a, a teenager. What I probably would do for your child is I probably would use a local anesthetic, and by that I mean the injection of 1% xylocaine. Uh, if it's around the eye, you can do a regional nerve block. You can get the inferior orbital nerve here, the supratrochlear nerve here. Uh, you can get most of the face here with an injection in front of the ear. So probably the best thing for your child would be a regional nerve block if they don't want to be put under anesthesia. The results with the topical anesthetics can be much less predictable. Jennifer says her daughter did four treatments, four months to one year. She was stopped it because they didn't want to put her under to control treatments. Do we need to start treatments again um, in a certain time frame, or can we wait until she's four or five? Is there any harm? I think that's about recurrence. Yeah, right? I, would, I would encourage you to stick with the treatments, Jennifer, and, and have your daughter uh, retreated, restart the treatment as soon as possible. Well, hello, Mimi Anderson from Europe. We know it's in the middle of the night there, though. So thank, thank you for you, staying thank up. Thank you for staying up and sending all your questions in. Her first one is on the latest on photodynamic therapy and PDL combo trials and wider implementation. The tri combos. The P I'm sorry. The what trials? The um PD the photodynamic therapy and PDL combo. Okay. Well, that I'm not familiar with, so I don't want to say because I just I'll have to look that up after we're done with the uh, Facebook live and see but I'm not aware of people doing combination treatments with PDL and photodynamic therapy. 
Um, Megan wants to know if the port wine stain and hypertrophy, if you see them together often. Well, we see them as a late sequelae, not in infants and young children, uh, but if the port wine stains are particularly thick or they are deep into the underlying soft tissue, muscle, and bone, hypertrophy can be a sequelae of port wine stains. Um, Mimi has another question because she's answering for some people. How does the PDL and Synergy Multiplex and NDA compare safely and um, efficacy-wise? How old till both can be used during treatment? Well, we, had, we tested the Synergy Multiplex here several years ago, and I wasn't happy with the results of the treatment. Uh, I don't like to use the NDAG laser to treat port wine stains unless it's nodules that are on the surface of the skin, uh, which I did yesterday. Uh, the YAG laser penetrates very deep into skin. Uh, the absorption for blood at the infrared wavelength is very low, which means you have to use very high energies of it, which puts you at risk for developing a scar after the laser treatment. So I am not an advocate of using the ND YAG laser to treat port wine stains, particularly in infants and young children. Good. That's a great answer. Um, Jess Hayden wants to know, while we await for treatment to start on our infant, are there any precautions we should take? I'm not sure what happens if he gets a sunburn or if sunblock is good enough to protect it. Well, I would just I'd get hats, sunscreens, get a transparent zinc oxide, get something like Blue Lizard, which is an Australian uh, sunscreen, which has a transparent zinc oxide in it. I use it because I'm allergic to a lot of sunscreens, uh, but a good sunscreen and a hat to completely cover all the face. Um, so we have um, Nina from Australia uh, who's um, writing in. And she has a little boy, Henry, and he has a pretty extensive port wine on his hands, arms, chest, back of his back. He's seven months old, and the doctors there told him that they recommend that they wait till he's three years old, mainly due to the risk associated with general anesthesia and brain development. They said we are risking lowering his IQ with lasering earlier than three years of age. Well, I would treat that your child as soon as possible, but also based on Linda's description of your child's lesion, your child needs to also be worked up for underlying Klippel-Trenone syndrome. And maybe Sturge Weber if it's on his face. And uh, I would recommend that he have an MRI of his chest as well as the entire involved upper extremity to rule out underlying Klippel-Trenone syndrome. Um, Peggy Buck, she's 69 and she wanted to put that in, that she had laser treatments about 20 years ago with Dr. Jerome Garden, who we all know. She said her daughter says it was lightened, but now she's getting bumps and wondering if they can be eliminated with the laser at this age. Sure, absolutely. I treated a 71-year-old yesterday with some vascular nodules with that ND lag laser that I was just talking about. Uh, certainly with the Alexandrite or even in some cases the PDL, depending on the thickness of the nodules. So Peggy, I would encourage you to resume your treatment and your nodules can be flattened and smoothened out. Uh, Gabrielle wants to know, can the Prima be used in children? Sure, absolutely. It's just simply the V-Beam, uh, newer version of it. Uh, as I said, there's only four devices that are in, being tested right now, uh, but the company is cautiously optimistic. They'll have it on the market early next year, and as I said, Beckman's already ordered one. Um, that's a, a follow-up that Mimi wants to know is when will the VB be available for pediatric use and in the interim can a, a larger spot size 15 millimeter be used with VB and Perfecta? With the Perfecta right now the energies from the device aren't uh, high enough to support the yeah. use of a 15 millimeter spot. So the new Candela laser, the V-beam, what is the difference between V-beam and PDL? Well, the, a V-beam is a type of pulse dye laser. There are several different pulse dye lasers on the market. Uh, 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 Cineron has one uh, called the V-beam. Uh, Sinusure has the Synergy that we just talked about. And there's some other companies in Europe and in Asia uh, that also have different types of pulse dye lasers that are on the market. Uh, Melissa is from Boston, and she, um, we're, I'm going to recommend that you uh, go contact me, and I can refer you to Dr. Mims Clinic at the um, Mass General Hospital. Uh, she said she went to Children's, and they said that her child has a stubborn stork bite, and that she did get laser, and it lightened it, but that mm -hmm. she does have some marks on her upper lip that are persistent. So it sounds like she should still pursue laser. And stork bite really is between the eyes. I mean, the stork bite is, yeah. Usually just, you see it on the glabella, yeah, the forehead, right. the nose, and the upper lip. And they tend to respond very, very well to laser yep. treatment. Um, and Mimi wants to know, is a double pass 
with varying MS, i.e. 0.45 and 1.5, safe for pediatric as well as adult. Yes, I do that routinely at our institution. I mean, you're not going to make those passes immediately. You're going to move away to other areas of the port wine stain so you don't induce bulk heating or put some ice onto the skin between doing the successive passes. Uh, but that can be done very, very safely. Uh, Jill says her five-month-old is going to the Mayo Clinic on August 14th. She's nervous but glad to have this group. We At one month, we found out she also has glaucoma. So that means she is, has port, uh, Sturge Weber type 2. So, Jill, you might want to research Sturge Weber type 2, which is the cutaneous stain along with glaucoma. And to, for everyone that's logged in right now, we still have a lot of openings for our conference in October. That's going to be right here with Dr. Nelson at the Beckman Laser Institute. We have seven teams. You could see the Sturge Weber team, KT team, hemangioma team, and we're giving lasers, free lasers this year for um, people who qualify for the free treatments. And when you register, we'll follow up with you on that. Uh, Diana says, is it normal for a treatment to make the parts of the port wine stain look worse? 12 to 14 weeks post-treatment. You can because, I mean, you're, you're, you can induce in basically an inflammatory dermatitis uh, because there, some light is going to be absorbed by the upper layer of the skin. That when you're doing these laser treatments and coagulating the blood vessels, there's an inflammatory reaction that goes on underneath the skin. And sometimes, yes, for a couple of weeks after the laser treatment, the skin can actually look more red. Um, Krasmer has another question. He's had three treatments and he's very happy with the, the fading with the V-beam. He's just wondering how many treatments for the laser before it will stop working. And I, I guess you can't really tell. You can't really tell. Each one of these sure. lesions is highly unique. Uh, the blood vessel diameter, depth in human skin is highly variable on an individual patient basis. So it's often very, very difficult to give families an estimate of exactly how many treatments are going to be required. Um, Mimi wants to know the difference in using either an ultrasound, an MRI, or an MRA on extensive port wines of the extremities. Well, these are, these are imaging techniques. They're not, they're not laser treatment. I mean, ultrasound is ultrasound. MRI, MRA is magnetic resonance angiography. Well, I think she imaging. wants to know which one of those will give you a better definitive diagnosis if it is like KT. Well, it would be the magnetic resonance angiogram by far. Um, Jen McNerney said, hi, Dr. Nelson. Chloe misses you. Hi, Pete. Hi, Pete. Say hi to PJ. She back for lasers. She wants to know when they're going to come back. Well, she's so busy with her. a couple of children. So tell her to just make an appointment, right? Like, We're happy anytime. You're happy yeah. to see you and PJ, Jen. Uh, Diana says, is it normal for treatments to make parts of the port wine look worse? Oh, yeah, she said that. She says, specifically, the edges surrounding the spots look very red, darker than the original. Yeah, as I said, you can definitely induce an inflammatory dermatitis uh, when you're doing these repeated treatments, particularly when you're doing it aggressively. It's not unusual for the skin in certain areas to look a little bit redder. So the woman who asked you if she should continue and you recommended she does said, does it become more resistant as she ages? Is that why you want her to continue treatment. Well, I, she, I thought, asked me about the blebs that she was having on the surface of the skin, which, you know, if, if those aren't treated, they're going to get worse. Uh, she may develop spontaneous bleeding from those blebs. So even if you don't want to have your entire port wine stain treated, Peggy, I would encourage you to at least get those nodules or blebs flattened and smoothened up. Okay, so Mimi said they were told uh, sometimes the lip regrows after surgical redu reduction or debulking. That can certainly can occur. Uh, those are questions that might be better addressed by Milton Weiner and Greg Levitin who do those types of procedures. I don't, uh, but you still have got a, a, a hypervascular lip as a result of the port wine stain, so it would not surprise me that somebody over the course of, the life, of their lifetime might have to have two or perhaps three lip reduction surgeries. And remember that the, what we believe that controls us is the nervous system, so even if you correct the lip, the deficiency that's in the nervous system will persist. Um, okay, uh, Ashley wants to know. This is, but do you do you treat lymphatic vascular malformations? Uh, I don't specifically because lasers are not a good uh, treatment for lymphatic malformations. Most of those cases, although they come to Beckman, we make the diagnosis. Uh, we refer them principally to our radiology colleagues, our interventional radiology colleagues. And most of those patients are being treated with combined uh, intralesional injections of scleral therapy agents. And also, remarkably, a lot of those patients are now being placed on Cialis 
and Viagra, sildenafil. Those have been shown. Serolimus too. And serolimus as well. Those drugs have definitely been shown to decrease the lymphatic drainage, particularly in the superficial areas of the skin. Uh, so most of those patients are now being managed medically as well as also by interventional radiology, not um, by laser. Mimi wants to know, after you've exhausted the laser treatments and it's plateaued, what are the alternatives for a resistant port wine stain? Well, just to go to a maintenance type of approach so that the port wine stain doesn't uh, insidiously get darker with time as well as develop the vascular nodules or the blebs. Um, Mimi wants to know about KTP subcutaneously administered for adults. Well, the KTP, KTP stands for potassium titanyl phosphate. Uh, that's a green wavelength laser. Uh, it's a device uh, that's, been, that's been manufactured by some other com uh, companies. Uh, I have not found the KTP laser to be as helpful in terms of its ability to treat port wine stains as compared to the pulse dye laser. Jesse wants to know if you know of any P derms that you recommend in North Carolina. Uh, not off the top of my head, we but have, um, Dr. certainly. Sh yeah, Dr. Sean, Sean Freeman is a PED ENT, and Dr. Um, Darrow isn't far, and then in South Carolina is Dr. Marcelo Hockman. But if you go to the VBF website at birthmark.org, you can see our physician list. And I would encourage you to contact the departments of dermatology at the Duke University School of Medicine, oh, Duke, Duke as well does. as UNC yes. School of Medicine departments of dermatology. Yeah. Duke does have someone. Uh, Ashley says her son has the lymphatic with possibility of KT, and he did. This doctor did use a laser, but he now sees Dr. Yakes for ethanol injections. Would the laser be any, any? would help him anyway in any possibility. Well, the problem with KT is you've got a congenital absence of the deep venous system, which means the blood's being shunted to the superficial veins, which is what causes the, the port wine stain. So I do, the, I do these cases in collaboration with my interventional radiologists. If possible, I like my interventional radiologist to close off that shunting because it definitely makes the laser treatment much more effective. So if the radiologist, Dr. Yakes, is able to cut off those perforators, then the laser treatment definitely will be much better, and it would be something that I would recommend you pursue. Hi, Peggy Nelson from Linda and your husband, Stuart. <laughs> um, uh, Portia asked if uh, the serolimus can actually reduce the lip. I have not heard of that, that had, uh, but it is a chemotherapy agent, so I guess it's possible, right? I, I am not aware of it reducing, I'm not aware of it but I mean, all this whole field of the use of anti-angiogenic agents is still very, very new, new, very early, and in my opinion, probably serolimus is not going to be the agent that we're going to be using. I think there are much better choices which disrupt that whole biochemical pathway of cell proliferation and vascular proliferation at a higher level. Um, okay, thank you. So Maria said her port, um, daughter has a port wine on her forehead, eye, and scalp. She's 17 months, was told she doesn't need an MRI or neurologist consult unless she shows symptoms. Is that correct? Well, we typically don't. I mean, we counsel patients in that age group when they have a V1 dermatomal port wine stain. We tell them they're at risk. Uh, about 15 to 20 percent of people who have V1 port wine stains will have underlying Sturge Weber syndrome. So I tell the family, you know, we don't necessarily jump immediately to the MRI, MRA, because if Ann Comey were here, who's an expert in Sturge Weber from Hopkins, she'll tell you that the MRI, MRA can be normal up until the age of one year. So what we tell the families is if, you know, if there's a concern from the pediatrician that the child isn't meeting their, mel their milestones, if there's concerns about development, or if there is a seizure or there is some other neurological development, then at that point we'll aggressively pursue a workup for Sturge Weber syndrome. Uh, Gabrielle wants to know how many non-fading treatments do you need to have been considered maintenance? I probably, would say two probably, or three. Yeah, I probably I would say at least three treatments. Yeah, three. So if you see no clearance after it with three consecutive treatments, then you're technically in maintenance. Yes. Right. Tiffany wants to know once you get the stain to the level of clearance you want, how often after that do you have to get maintenance? I would say, you know, at least two to three times a year probably. Um, okay, so Peggy just posted to someone that she also had glaucoma but not found until six years and the retina detached, hooray for modern medicine, that's right. Michelle says her daughter has a port wine over 60% of her body. We got through eight treatments before she had a horrible reaction. 
that looked like third degree burns and they talked about putting her in the burn unit. It had been a few years. Should we try again? You know, absolutely. I mean, it would be good to see what the medical records of what the, that particular treatment was and what may have gone wrong because then that's certainly unusual. I mean, a third degree burn by definition is, is, is not just some scabbing or blistering, which occasionally you can see after a pulse dilator treatment. I mean, you're talking about burn injury to underlying soft tissue. So. so, Michelle, you can send your information to Dr. Nelson directly. We've been posting his email, or it should be scrolling. I haven't seen it, but it's birthmark.org backslash Dr. Nelson. Or Nelson, um, somebody will correct me on that. But you'll see it in this chain or this string of where to post to him. Uh, Lindsay says her son has an extensive port wine stain on his leg. Uh, it's light and patchy. It's darker on his butt cheeks. Some days his butt cheeks looks a little swollen. Others normal. He, his limbs have measured the same, but he seems to swell the first two weeks after treatment. Well, that's and certainly, you know, I would be concerned about underlying Klippel-Trenane syndrome. Uh, that's a con not only you have the port wine stain, as we've discussed, you have an absence of the deep venous system, but also the lymphatic system is also poorly developed and that could be an explanation as to why he's having that prolonged swelling in his lower extremity after the laser treatment. Um, Patricia said she saw Dr. Garden for the first time and had to go to plastic surgeon to have some large blebs removed. In the meantime, Dr. Garden said she needed to lose the tan. Is there anything I can do to move the process along? Well, Jer Dr. Jerry Garden is right. Move, stay out of the sun with hats and sunscreens. And the other thing that you could do is, although it does take six weeks, is you could use some hydroquinones, yep, which cream. block the synthesis of melanin. So the pigment you have in your skin right now is going to take about six weeks to move up to the surface of the skin and shed off, but it will prevent the synthesis of new pigment. But the most important thing is stay out of the sun. Diane wants to know if treatments can prevent, um, have treatments around the lip area just so the lip doesn't get enlarged if it's not enlarged and they're staying on the lip. Yeah, if they're staying on the lip, we will treat that area when we're doing the laser treatment, so absolutely do it. Uh, George said his son has a stubborn deep port wine stain on his face and we're in maintenance mode, but are wondering with the new laser, will it reach deeper port wine, meaning the Prima? Well, the, the depth of penetration of light into human skin is a function of the wavelength. So the wavelength of the Prima is going to be the same as the wave wavelength of the current V-beam. So one would expect from an optical point of view that no, the light from that laser is not necessarily going to go deeper into the skin. Um, what is the chance of a port wine saying to develop blebs or thicken? Like, do we have any data on that? Well, Milton Weiner did publish something on, on, on patients who were not treated. I, you know, we can certainly look that up. But the incidence was high. Like, it I was thought quite it was high. around 30 percent, wasn't yeah, it? It's quite something high. Like that. But Milt, the Weiner group published a paper on that about, a, about one to two years ago, and it should be available in Google. Um, Jeff Foster said his pediderm saw their daughter's mark on her leg and feels that it's a vascular capillary malformation, not necessarily a Port Wine stain. It's the same thing. The difference being the former was a sort of one-time malformation, whereas the latter Port Wine is ongoing. That. That's not correct. That's capillary. not correct. The, no. the, the no. current ISPA classification is a capillary vascular malformation. Port wine, port, wine. Yeah, port wine stain is basically a slang term. And, we, you know, I, and when I dictate my operative reports now, I write capillary vascular malformation because it actually ha does have an ICD-10 code, which helps with the insurance billing. So port wine stain is probably a term that we should probably, hopefully, over the course of the next couple of years, get rid of that term because it's not uh, well, anatomically. Well, I don't think you ever will, but... Well, it's not correct in terms of medically. I medical know. terminology, it's outdated. But it's it's a historical... It's thing. historical, but yeah. uh, we need um, to move so, on. So, um, Diane wants to know, during maintenance, should she return to treatments only when you see darkening? No, I would encourage you to, to probably do it at least twi twice a year. Um, Barbara said she's been asked to stop treatments um, on her one month old after four months of treating on propranolol. Doesn't that seem too soon? I thought ideally the child should be maintained one year of propranolol until proliferative phase has ended. Well, we're talking about hemangioma, and typically at our institution we will keep those children on the propranolol for probably at least one to two months after we're completely sure that the proliferative phase is, is, is resolved, and then we will gradually withdraw the propranolol 
over a, a prolonged period of time, you, typically the rule of thumb is 25% of the time that the child was on the propranolol. So if your child was on propranolol for a year, you would gradually withdraw the drug over a course of about three months, but not abruptly stop it. Oh, this is a great question from Leah Carter. Can the laser be used on a rapidly involuting congenital hemangioma that is still noticeable? Absolutely, absolutely. Great question. Absolutely. In fact, it will help stimulate that hemangioma yes. to involute even quicker. Great question. Crystal wants to know they've been using fentanyl via intranasal for pain relief on our baby here in Australia prior to PDL as well as numbing cream. It's being used on teenagers as well. We use intranasal fentanyl in our infants and young children routinely for pain management. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Oh, Barbara said, correction, I've been asked to stop treatment on my six-month-old after four months of treatment on propranolol. Well, the question is, is the, is the hemangioma still in the proliferative phase or is there concern that it's in the proliferative phase? And also, also where, is the, where is the hemangioma? If it's on the nose or in the parotid area, those are noted areas where you can see resistance and recurrence. So, I mean, there, you know, you're, I just don't know enough factors, details yeah. that they're going it. into this. But here's a good rule of thumb. Once you taper, if it's too soon, it will rebound. If it doesn't rebound, you may be... It may be good to go off. But six months sounds awful it early to sound me. It does early because that's the peak of proliferation. Yeah, I mean, most. I mean, the proliferative phase classically can occur up till eight to fourteen months. So that's to, removing the propranolol at age six months does sound a little bit early to me. So Jody wants to know if people with KTS can benefit from physical therapy for lymphedema, like the manual lymph drainage and compression stockings. Well, the most important thing that I found, and this was actually recommended to me by Marty Min, was swimming. Get in the pool, swim laps, get in, a, in a, some kind of a pool and just move your legs and take that advantage of uh, the muscular contractions in your leg for pumping out that lymphedema. And Marty Mim told me that t 10 years ago, and that is still the best treatment for lymphedema uh, for a KTS patient that I'm aware of. the of. extremities, yep. Uh, Mimi says, Sturge Weber risk for a typical VTO glaucoma test at three months was clear that it can still occur. It can still occur, and so, I mean, if we're, I, we recommend that children be tested annually uh, for their glaucoma, even if the first test is initially negative. Okay, I just want to correct that it's the, the email for Dr. Nelson is birthmark.org backslash Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N. Uh, Parto wants to know, will the laser, how much will the laser reduce the thickening of the lip? Like, how much, what percentage would it's, you get? If, you, if the child has already got hypertrophy of, of the lip, it's very, very doubtful that the laser will be helpful. In fact, that's a child that I would recommend consider having surgical excision. Or an adult. Because, yeah. not all, I mean, you've got the dilated blood vessels, but you've also got a thickened soft tissue. And the laser is just not going to be helpful for that. That child needs to be referred uh, for surgical consultation. Or, doctor, or adult. On the, if, okay. So Nikki wants to know, how often do you recommend laser treatments for the best results? Well, like if it's in infants and in young children, where, as I said earlier, we're doing it every two to four weeks. We'd like to get those children as young as possible. Uh, Lori, Laurel said she, her doctor used to see a Dr. Rubin in D.C., but she resigned two months ago from Children's National, so they're unable to replace Dr. Rubin. Um, she doesn't think her daughter's birthmark is a port wine stain. It's more like a CM, ACN syndrome, meaning maybe cutis mamorata. But the doctor did the MRI that was the time, and it ruled it out um, and said it's a port wine. I guess, Laurel, why don't you just email that picture to Dr. Nelson at the email address that we provided, birthmark.org backslash Nelson. Let him have a look at it, and he'll be able to tell you more, correct? Yeah, I know I reached Rubin very, very well. I did not know that she resigned from the National Children's Medical Center. But in the D.C. area where you are, you have Dr. Bernie Cohen at Johns Hopkins, a professor of pediatric dermatology. I would highly recommend that you have your child evaluated by Dr. Cohen. Um, Lauren um, asks, can you discuss the use of PDL on the lip and the gums? Well, we can. you can certainly... Treat, if the port wine stain involves the lip and the gum, you can certainly treat those areas with the pulse dye laser. But if you're working on the buccal mucosa or you're working on the gum where you have teeth, you've got to be careful not to use the PDL around the nerve root because that nerve root is very vascular and there have been reports of people infarcting or destroying the blood supply to the tooth itself. 
So you cannot be using in, immediately inferior or superior, depending on whether it's the upper or lower teeth. Uh, Dana, Dana asked, she wants to know, do you move on to using other lasers on a stubborn stain in infants or toddlers or just move on to maintenance? When you, you know? Primarily we move on to maintenance because I have not found the Alexandrite laser to be particularly helpful in infants and young children, although I will use it for nodules or blebs. Um, Abby said, as per your previous answer, once my one-year-old goes into maintenance mode, she's had 20 treatments so far for the rest of her life. She will have. Will she have to have two to three treatments a year? I mean, as we sit here, July nineteenth, two thousand seventeen. I mean, that's probably the standard of where we are right now. But who knows with with lasers in the future? We just have to all know. Oh, she. W it was CM AVM syndrome. So just again, Laurel, send that to Dr. Nelson. Can you give me a time check on your watch, Dr. Nelson? My watch says six forty-four p.m. Five forty. There's six. We started at six forty-four. Okay, so we. That'd have, be very unique if we can go back sorry. in time. <laughs> sorry, I'm on New York time, <laughs> so I'm not even on New York time. Um, just wanted to check in, so we have about fifteen more minutes. Um, if you treat the lip before six months, how much chance is there for the lip to to grow? Well, it, it depends on how deep into the underlying soft tissue the blood vessels actually extend. Uh, but most of those children, if you can treat them as young as possible, you have the best opportunity to prevent the lip hypertrophy from developing. Um, Jeff said, if not present at birth, when would you blend or, or thickening begin to be noticeable? Well, it can happen at any time, but usually this is something that happens... Oh, bleb. The bleb. Oh, I saw the bleb or the thickening, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, blebs tend to not, not to occur until people are 20 or 30 years of age. Um, that's definitely a, a secondary phenomenon. It's, it's unusual to see blebs and nodularity in infants and young children and even teenagers. Barbara um, qualified, and I'm going to respond to this too. Her six months old had the periorbital uh, hemangioma that was causing the stigmatism. So it sounds like it's best to wean or to wait. Absolutely, 100%. absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Wean, wait, and wean. Yes, wait and wean. Because your child could be at risk for amblyopia if that lesion starts to regrow, and then you've got to start all over again. So absolutely, wait and then wean. Um, Kate McGinnis, she says she's messaged me, so I'm assuming we've spoke. She's the one who has a oh yeah, she's the mom who has a port wine on her face. And then her daughter has a hemangioma on her shoulder. Uh, we have yet to see a derm here in the Philly area. Um, you know, you can always go to New York and see Dr. Geronimus. Or in the Philadelphia area, I can highly recommend Dr. Eric Bernstein. Eric is highly experienced in the clinical management of vascular malformations. Uh, he's also one of the people who's doing the trial, along with Dr. Geronimus, of the new Prima system that's going to come out next year. Um, Jonathan says her daughter, um, their, his daughter has been receiving treatments with pulse dye since six months old for a Port Weinstein. She contribute, continued treatment several times a year. And she's now eight. She hasn't had any, and they're taking a, a year and a half off. We're planning on resuming next year. Should we be concerned about losing progress? Well, not I mean, if you're objectively seeing that the port wine stain is insidiously and slowly getting darker, then I would recommend you restart that treatment as soon as possible. But if you're comfortable and you're not seeing a lot of objective changes in your child, then it's reasonable to wait a year or so. I would just be concerned that when your daughter goes through puberty, you're definitely going to see some changes in that port wine stain. Well, she so, might even be pre-puberty right now yeah. at 8, so yeah. it might be time to like think about it. Um, Alessandra, she's like concerned about the gum. She said her 3-year-old has a thicker and kind of overgrowth of the gum, so should it be treated with laser or surgery at this point at three? Well, at this particular point in time, she needs to, your child needs to be evaluated by an experienced oral surgeon or somebody like David Darrow who can give you the answer to that sort of type of question because not only has your child got the port wine stain, but they've obviously got enlargement of the underlying soft tissue, muscle, and very likely bone. So your child probably needs a CAT scan or a Pandorex of their entire upper and lower jaws, and uh, that's something that needs to be done by a, a competent and experienced uh, oral surgeon. And Brad Gilchrist gave us a shout out. Thank you for everything you do. You're welcome, Thank Brad. Thank you, Brad. He's one of Brad's one of our patients that got treatment this year. Uh, Crystal said her son is 10 years old, has a facial V2, V3, 31 treatments under GA. Our doctor has never mentioned treating without it. Any idea why that would be? 
maybe just comfortable with the GA, right? If, you, if they're comfortable with it, I mean, we, we I, 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 doctor, she's wondering why the doctor never offered the block or. Well, that's, it's, I, like, I don't know who the treating physician is. I mean, I, I tell patients that there are many, many ways to do this with topical, with regional blocks, with no anesthesia whatsoever, general anesthetics. I mean, we have the options here because we have our pediatric anesthesiologist here. So I let the family decide what they want us to do. We'll do what they want. Um, Diana wants to know what a recommended setting would be for a Hispanic infant with V2 with a light pore wine stain. I guess you'd have to know her, her skin color. We really need to know the skin type. I mean, Hispanics have darker skin phototypes, so they have a higher concentration of epidermal melanin. Uh, so you've got to back off a little bit on the light dosage uh, when you're treating patients with darker skin types. Another thing that you can do is increase the pulse duration of the laser exposure, again, to get away from those high peak powers uh, which can damage the normal overlying epidermis. Um, Jennifer asked a question, and I think um, some others have asked this too. She's 35, and she's worrying about... Um, if she'll develop hypertrophy. She said it's darker, but will she develop, will the skin thicken? Well, if, if she's 35 now and that hasn't developed, that makes the chances of that much, much less likely. As I said, the typical hypertrophy starts to begin really around the age of puberty and then into the teenage and early 20s. Um, so Fatah wrote in about his daughter, and he says that she has a birthmark covering her arm and that they're a different size. He wants to know what the diagnosis and treatment would be. Well, the, one would be very, very, very highly suspicious that their child has underlying Klippel-Trenone syndrome, and I would encourage you to have your child evaluated uh, primarily with magnetic resonance angiography of the involved extremity uh, to make that diagnosis before considering laser treatment. Um, so Laurel just kind of qualified what she said that um, Dr. Rubin said it was a Port wine stain. Um, and then Dr. Krikorian said CM, AVM, but her daughter doesn't have any seizures. Her eyes are doing fine. Um, See Dr. Know, Bernard Cohen at Johns Hopkins. Ber no, Bernstein. Bernard oh, Cohen. Oh, yeah. We're talking. Oh, yeah, John Buddy Bernstein's Cohen. in Philadelphia, yeah. but um, she's in right, the D.C. Right. area. Mariah said, can you explain a little more about the sun in port wine? Do they need to be completely covered, the port wine? Well, I would say absolutely because any ultraviolet light exposure activates melanin which is the pigment in your skin which causes you to tan in response to ultraviolet light exposure. Uh, the epidermal melanin is superior in the skin above the port wine stain. So when you're using the laser, if you have a high concentration of melanin or the patient's tanned, it makes the laser treatment less effective. So if patients come in, if they're tanned, I, I don't want to treat them. Um, Tiffany wants to know anybody you recommend in Australia. Uh, the only person that I'm aware of is uh, Dr. Beckor, Philip Beckor. I've been to Australia several times. Uh, Philip is working out of Melbourne. Uh, he's very highly experienced. Uh, he comes to the national meetings here in the United States. So I would recommend a consultation with Dr. Philip Beckor in Melbourne. Or um, Melbourne, I hope I'm not mispronounced. <laughs> so Jill, Jilly Bear says, for adults 36 years old with Sturge Weber and large port wine, 75% of her face and neck, is there a benefit to laser? She's had dozens of treatments, but um, no major difference. Well, I, I, I'd be happy to review photographs, and I think I would also be happy to review, review what the laser treatment parameters were be uh, to see if there's an opportunity to perhaps change the pulse duration of the laser exposure uh, to target blood vessels of different sizes. Um, so someone asked that, they said that um, when you do the surgery on the lip to debulk it, it regrows after six months. Well, again, uh, I'm not somebody who does those procedures. That's a question that you need to ask through Linda and the VBF, probably to either doctors Milton Weiner or Gregory Leviton, who are surgeons who are doing those procedures. Or you can see them at the conference here in Irvine in October. Uh, they're both coming. Right. And remember, the conference is free for anyone who can't afford to pay. Uh, we get free lodging, free clinic appointments, free laser this year, free dental exam this year. It's at birthmark.org. Do not forget to register for this very important conference. Experts in KTS, experts in Sturge Weber, um, psychotherapy sessions, free makeup for the patient with a birthmark. So don't forget that. We have only a couple minutes left. What time is it, Dr. Nelson? It is 6.54. So we have only six minutes left. Um, Vicki wants to know that her daughter has a port wine on her shoulder and now has a mask growing. 
She's 25, and we're having a hard time finding a doctor in Oregon. Well, go to the OHSU, Dr. Ken Lee, who's head of dermatologic surgery up at OHSU. I would recommend that your, uh, the patient be evaluated by Ken Lee. Um, Lindsay said her doctor is offering nitrous oxide for comfort, and his nine-month-old son is getting harder to hold. Is this safe for him? Now, we do that for a lot. Of, a lot of the children don't like the smell of the anesthetic agents, so one of the ways to help alleviate that is to put in a mixture of, of nitrous oxide. Uh, one of my anesthesiology colleagues actually told me that the nitrous oxide actually improves the absorption of the anesthetic agent. So there can be several reasons uh, where the use of nitrous oxide uh, can actually be helpful. Okay, only a couple more. So Ashley has a 15-month-old, and um, they're not lasering the area around the hair. She's worried that that will thicken. If it's not. Treated. It can thicken, but the problem is if you air, if you treat an area, a hair-bearing area, uh, the light from the laser can also be absorbed by the hair follicle and there's about a 20 to 25 percent chance uh, that you'll induce permanent alopecia. So what I tell the families is we will stay away from the hairline and later on we can talk about it if the family's willing to shave the head later or if they're willing to accept the risk of 20, 20 to 25 percent permanent alopecia. Uh, Katie, um, the doctor that trained with Dr. Geronimus that's in Texas that we recommend is Dr. Paul Friedman. He's on the VBF website at birthmark.org. Uh, Leah, he's in Houston. Or he's in Houston, right, thank you. Leah Bradley said she's 30, she has lymphangiomas on her abdomen, 25 surgeries, sclerotherapies. If there's any new lasers out, that would be able to help her. I don't really think Probably so. not. As I said, somebody asked me about lymphatic malformations earlier. I would recommend you uh, talk to the interventional radiologist about sclerosing the underlying lymphatic malformation, and then also serious consideration be given to concurrent medical therapy with either Cialis, Viagra, or also Sirolimus or Rapamycin. Um, so to try to get a few more in, Katie, a hemangioma has to be removed if it's distorting the tissue, if it's obstructing vision or airway or ulcerating. Um, you can send me pictures and I can forward them on to Dr. Wayner Daphne. She has a 14-week-old that's had two treatments at settings of 0.45 ms, 6.5 to 7.5 joules, CM2, 7 millimeter spot. There's hardly any purpura. Does this mean settings are too low and that treatment is less effective? Well, in that age group, I probably would have started with a little bit of a longer pulse duration, probably the one and a half millisecond pulse duration. Uh, but with not having seen photographs or examined the patient, it's difficult for me to say what exactly uh, the treatment parameters will I use. But typically for infants and young children, uh, we're using the one and a half millisecond pulse duration to start. Okay, a quick one. Uh, uh, Virginia's daughter has a port wine on her forehead and scalp. Should she get an MRI? Well, she has about a 20% chance of having Sturge Weber syndrome. So as long as they understand what the risks are. She should certainly be evaluated by a neurologist. Uh, a couple of years ago, Ann Comey told me that actually the MRI, as I said earlier, can be normal up until the age of one, uh, but perhaps some of the EEG studies may be abnormal earlier and could be picked up. So at the minimum, I think your child should be evaluated by a neurologist and at least have an EEG done. Uh, Alice Sandra wants to know, well, you just answered that. Laurel said, Oh, it's Dr. Um, Bernard Cohen, and he's listed on the VBF website at birthmark.org under um, at John Hopkins. Um, okay, we're going to have to wrap it up so we can only take a couple more. Renee said her daughter is a two-year-old African-American. She was diagnosed with a port wine at birth covering her right cheek and underneath her cheek, and the right side of her face is slightly larger than the, the left. What are her options? Well, I'd like to see photographs or, of your child because, I mean, it would be unusual to have a port wine stain already at the age of two causing hypertrophy. I mean, I, I think your child, they might want to look a little bit closer to make sure there isn't something underlying this, like perhaps an underlying venous malformation. I think your child probably, I would recommend, have some type of imaging study to rule out some kind of underlying vascular malformation. Okay, so our last question, Crystal wants to know how you can tell if the baby has port wine on the gum. You can see it. You I tell the it. moms to put a flashlight in there because you don't think to look at the roof of the mouth or around the gums. Um, I want to thank you all for tuning in today. I want to especially thank Dr. Nelson. I'll be back in November uh, out here in California. And, um, we're going to be back in October for the conference. Well, yes, but we're doing our Facebook Live with Dr. Darrow 
in October who will be covering uh, gum issues and port wine stains, a very important Facebook Live session. But we'll be back again since we have a lot of questions for Dr. Nelson in November. So you can also replay this video. Please share it with as many groups and new moms and dads who have babies with port wines and adults. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Nelson, for answering the questions for everyone. And we're going to sign off now. You want good to say night. goodbye? Thank you. Depending where you are in the world. We were going to talk about this. We talked about this. That's all right. We're going to send a letter. We're going to draft a letter.